Hello, and welcome to Your Sparkly Brand. We're here to inspire and empower entrepreneurs like you. This podcast is all about delivering no fluff, high value content that helps you grow your business. It doesn't matter if you have no budget and are still DIYing everything on your own. We give you the tips, tools, and strategies you need to build a sparkly empire. I'm Lauren Tassi, your copywriter and launch strategist, and I'm joined by my co-host, marketing and branding expert, Megan Gersh. Hi, Megan. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm so pumped to introduce you to our guest today, Kathleen O. She she is a coach, a writer, and a safe drug use advocate and educator specializing in psychedelic integration. She offers coaching services focused on the continued care of the well-being of her clients that thrive in the high-stress, high-performance careers. Despite the challenge of unpopular conversations, writing, and truth-telling won't just let it go. Speaking up about the brutal truth and psychedelic use ultimately got her to micro-influencer status, and ultimately this got her Instagram account banned. Kathleen stretches healing into deceptively simple places with unapologetic words, now sharing openly and honestly on Substack. Welcome to the podcast, Kathleen. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. And that was really well put together. Thank you. So Kathleen, before we jump into your story, we like to start each episode with our sparkly moment of the week. It's like a little win or a celebration. Meg, what was your sparkly moment? So I am giving myself a little challenge this month and I just started it this morning. So every day in February, February, I will be going live on TikTok with the goal of helping a hundred small businesses. So I'm going to be doing website reviews for them and giving them essentially like actionable tips and advice to level up their website. So if you're listening to this, jump into one of my lives where I'm doing them every single day, 12 Pacific time, and hope to see you there. That's awesome. What about you? So I have just had time this past week to work on some more of my own marketing and the stuff that like I just never do and never get around to. I wrote like a seven email sequence for my funnel. And it just feels so good to be like doing it for myself. It's also reminds me how hard it is to do it for yourself versus doing it for clients. I love that. I love to make that time. And what about you, Kathleen? Do you have one you want to share? Yeah, I am super excited to share my sparkly moment. I <laughs> have been, as you mentioned, producing on Substack and completely voluntarily and unsolicited, I had a reader pledge a year subscription. So I do my Substack without a, f a subscription fee, but Substack is just upgraded to have a pledge. And somebody just gave me money. Like, That's awesome. Thank you. It was so good. Yeah. It means you're doing something right. Yeah. They I was quite moved. Awesome. Well, I am excited to hear about Substack, but let's maybe start before that. Tell me a little bit about how you got into what you do. What's your business journey? Yeah. Oh, great. You know, I don't think Megan knows this about me. And I definitely kind of caught my ear when she talks about her past in the music industry. And when I was just in college, I was a waitress. And then I got offered a job to be the personal assistant to a Canadian musician. And at the time, this was in the 90s. And at the time she was somewhat hot and very eclectic and an extreme perfectionist. So when I became her assistant, I had to really up my game in the industry. I had no idea. I was literally in college for social work and working a side gig as a waitress and then became this person that had to do her everything. And so what I learned in that part of my job is that I, I knew more than I thought with small businesses and running in a small operation. She went from being on a label to being independent. And all of those things were just things that I had to learn on the fly. So I feel like it was a really good lesson in entrepreneurship as well as the industry. And again, this was the 90s, so there wasn't a lot of online presence, but she had a lot of really good technology. So at that time I was on a Mac and like that seemed like a really big deal because artists were the only ones that were really just using that platform. So that was the beginning of my business career. But the not related second part to my career is that fortunately I was in the wrong job job and I got fired. And that firing led to being able to actually find government assistance for small business startups. So I was, like I said, I was in the wrong job. I was selling native art and wasn't really, I was talking back a little bit too much about the process and they didn't like that. So I ended up leaving that job. And because of my career 
path as a social worker, worked my way into small business as a therapist with the funding and with the background of this small business that I had sort of gathered through the early parts of my 20s. It's amazing. Can we ask who the, I'm just like literally <laughs> curious who the artist is now. Oh yeah, I'll tell you, but I, I would be surprised if you knew Jane Sibri. Oh, I'm not familiar. Yeah. Calling All Angels was a duet she did with Katie Lang. She was on the soundtrack to The Crow. Oh yeah, she very 90s. Of, yeah, she did a lot of work <laughs> with Peter Gabriel. Very so. cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about your business? What it is now, when you started it? Because I know you've sort of been through, you know, a few iterations and, you know, I don't want to spoil the story, but. <laughs> right. Yeah. So in 2007, I started a brick and mortar therapy practice. In 2012, therapy became regulated in Ontario where I live, and you had to have certain credentials in order to operate as a therapist. I went back to school. I studied at a continuing ed program through the University of Toronto. I became a coach. At that point, that was a really good career move because I it really opened up for a lot of other options in my work. And so becoming a coach just meant that I could rather than work as a therapist and sort of problem focused, I could then work more as a coach and help people, you know, I changed my branding then as well. So I went from problems focused into solution focused and solution focused meant that people had somewhat worked out a lot of their problems and had found a certain level of success. And at that point between 2012 and probably 2018, a lot of my, I was really working with a lot of successful clients, a lot of coaching for professionals, not just business professionals, but athletes. And it was interesting to me that I was working with tennis players or hockey players, and I didn't know the sport. And when I was working with executives from different career paths, I didn't have to know their industry. I just had to know them and know them enough to help them know themselves enough to be better at their business or their or their sport. So I really was able to, with my previous training with positive psychology and solution focused coaching, help people find the patterns of their behavior and then use that sort of as a pivot to leverage them into a better success in their work. So that was really satisfying because I had good results with the clients and I had a good reputation. But again, that was still all brick and mortar. Everybody that I worked with was local and and I wanted to do a little bit more alternative work, I guess. And this is where the psychedelics come in because I had found within myself that I had kind of outgrown my own scope. So I was looking to figure out how to help people sort of more high level and being able to see bigger pictures and to, I had found that the sort of the pocket, the niche market that I was really gravitating they, into my practice were executives, mostly men that had really sort of got to the point in their life where they should be fulfilled and they weren't emotionally like they had all the toys they had everything that looked as if they would be successful in their lives but they didn't have the emotional connection to those things so it was kind of disappointing actually for them but also i was really curious about it and i started to look at systems that they had bought into and understood that capitalism and patriarchy was it wasn't just an accident that these people had achieved something and didn't feel anything they had been set up on this path of success which we all at that time i understood was the path to success and unfortunately it was a house of cards for people to get there and to not really be able to celebrate it or be connected to it so a lot of my work then at the time was reverse engineering kind of how they had worked their way up to that place and then been able figured out how they could connect to their success so sort of rebuilding themselves back to the place where they were able to arrive and most of that thankfully was them really learning as much as they could about themselves and nobody really taught them people taught them how to be successful and how to do business not really how to be a human some of the things that men in that at that time that i noticed they really Really didn't have a direct connection to their emotions. And one of the things at this, at this time, I was also recovering an alcohol addiction and was also quite disconnected. And when I removed the addiction, 
I had to really figure out how to reconnect my experiences and my emotions and my body. And what I learned, this is a bit counterintuitive, I'm recovering an alcohol addiction and discovering that psychedelics is something that may help. So the the part of microdosing specifically in this case is that microdosing actually was able to slow my brain down enough to really understand what thoughts and feelings were creating what emotions and experiences in my body. And so that work then became client work because I wasn't actually talking about my own experiences with psychedelics, but you know, these are smart people listening to podcasts and reading books and, you know, the little known secret of Silicon Valley is microdosing LSD. And that's been going on for decades. So this was 2016, 2017. And that really within myself, I was able to recover and learn enough about psychedelics and having people come to me, having their own experiences with psychedelics to put it together that this was actually something that was that was coming or that was happening. But in that time, psychedelics are pretty hot now, but at that time they're still pretty underground and still not legal, but then quite illegal. So I did have to do the research and also find that a lot of the systems within the drug world were also very oppressive and that I had to understand what I was getting myself into and not just start to just really co-op these modalities as somebody because, you know, it worked for me, it work, should work for everyone, but learn from people that had been around for decades and learning through books and through webinars and through teachers that I was able to find but this is all underground so it's not obvious these are not these are these at the time were not easy shoes to fill so thankfully i found those teachers and i was able to integrate my own healing and then bring that healing in 2019 to my practice. So I want to go back for a second too, because I know that you are focusing on kind of like high level achievers, high performance types type folks. Like, did it take some testing to kind of find that market? Did you test a few different audiences or was it, was that always kind of like the, the end goal to work with those types of folks? Definitely did not do testing mostly at that point because it was still in-person work, it was by word of mouth. So I just had a lot of good results with clients and then, you know, they told their friends. So it became something like, and also I was really working, able to see things that other either coaches or therapists weren't, which were these patterns and then helping because I really felt most of these people didn't want to sit around talking. They didn't want, they wanted to see like the strategy, I would say, for these entrepreneurs was really, again, solution focused was just to figure out, you know, how did we get here and how do we work out this problem? And then with good information, they were able to work with it. And, you know, I think having that strong reputation and a really good presence within the community was what brought me that niche market. And also just having the ability to see through the I want to say the bullshit like you know they these people were were you know they could fill a room and have big conversations but go home and feel nothing and that is really confusing and to talk to somebody about this very like strategic system that they've set up but also that they've been they are in that in an experience that they didn't even know that they are participating in so and to, you know, I don't know how many of those men are, you know, taking down the patriarchy, but I do know that they're aware of the system that they have participated in and are doing better to bring that into their companies and bring that into their homes and bring that into conversations. So I knew that it was working because they were able to use this in many aspects of their life, this recovery. So let's talk a little bit about what were some of the challenges you faced when you started speaking up publicly about psychedelics? Yeah, there was a lot. And thankfully, like I didn't have the voice online. I had a website. It was pretty discreet. If you knew the language, there were some things that people would be able to know, but it was kind of like you need to, you needed to know the secret knock in order to work with me, which I feel really fortunate. But when the pandemic hit, that was a very different story. So I had to really up my social media game. I had kind of gone dark on all social media. I went through a bad divorce and life just 
turned upside down. I was like, why do I want to be here? I don't use it for my business. So I I really had a, had no online presence for about five years. And prior to that, I never used it as a business. So I had a lot of catching up to do in 2020 when things became virtual and my pivot was in 2017, I did want to bring my business online. And so I knew all the systems of online business. I followed uh, you know, all the online bros marketing tips and I took all the courses, the expensive trainings that you can bring a friend for $100, join the mastermind teams because I was doing really well in my business. I thought I could eventually take it online, but I failed miserably. It wasn't, it really just wasn't my passion. So I kind of put that behind me because I thought, well, if I like, I'm just not meant to do it. And I did have to recover financially having invested a lot of money in trying. So I thankfully had the experience of failing. I knew enough about what I could do to open the door on the online business in March, 2020. So I took my entire practice from working with breath work and doing underground psychedelic work and also one-on-one coaching. And, you know, and by March 27th, I was fully up and running online. I feel really grateful that I had good support in place. I have late teens, adult children, and everybody was just sitting around. So I got a quick education in social media. And I also hired a social media manager because I just felt like I needed something quick and easy to get myself, you know, built up, which I did. And so thankfully I had the systems in place and people responded. I did a lot of free online work. I felt like it was something that I could give back. People had a lot of spare time. So for once a week, for months, months during the early parts of the pandemic, I opened up my practice and did breath work for free to usually on the weekends. I did a Thursday evening or a Sunday afternoon, and I was seeing between 50, 70 people that had never done breath work and had never done, had never met me, but I had an email list. I had friends that had social media accounts and people had time. It felt like a bit of a lottery winning that I had enough connections to enough people that I was able to build my own audience. How did you make the leap from breath work to psychedelics? It, like publicly. I know you're already doing, you're doing it behind the scenes. But. <laughs> I was really scared to talk about it, but enough people that were in my virtual classes were local people. So it was like, there was this underground whisper, what had been that was no longer. I maintained a studio space. People then started asking what I would do with the studio. And so I became braver with the conversations and start, I did start, you know, talking about microdosing and psychedelics as an alternative. Breathwork was definitely the legal and safe alternative, but to non-ordinary or altered states, psychedelics was like the, the next you know, you prepared with breath work and then we're able to do more sort of longer journeys or more in depth journeys with psychedelics. So it seemed really scary at the time. So March of 2020, I didn't have my first sort of big psychedelic break, you know, coming out until probably the early parts of 2021. And that's also thanks to TikTok, I was able to really build an audience fast. I was working specifically with Instagram, then I moved over to TikTok, and this was all paid with social media managers. And the original social media manager that I was working with thought I was bananas for considering TikTok. And so my daughter encouraged me And she said, mom, you've got to do it. I wish I could even remember the song back then, but it had moves and it was like, bah. And I was like, I am not doing that. And my daughter, who I guess at the time was 20 something, encouraged me and she's like, mom, just do it, just do it, just do it. And so we started and it was just kind of ridiculous. But I was talking about psychedelics and, you know, every three to four videos on TikTok got flagged and then I appealed it and it stayed up and then more people were talking, more people were asking. And thankfully I did have a funnel set up on my bio for to capture, you know, people to have those conversations with in private. And so people were able to speak directly to me either through my DMs or through email. And I had a viral video on TikTok, I think probably February of 20. 
21 and I got good and bad, all of it. And I figured out how to handle it quickly. I had hired Kenya Kelly was helping me because I was, I was losing my mind. I didn't know how to deal with a viral video and how to do that well. So I did my best and then continued to be able to just, I thought for sure, if this is a viral video, people want it and I'll keep talking about it. So I did. I just started blurting everything. <laughs> I was just like, there it is. There it is. And like, I got a lot of pushback. You know, people called me a drug addict. People called me a drug pusher. I talked about my own children using psychedelics. They're all adults. They're of age. And so like that didn't go well. But then on the other side, there was like, oh, tell me more. I've been on this medication for this long or I've never had you know an opportunity to learn about this and what's the best and legal most legal there's no legal way to do it but like how do I do this or how do I learn more about it I was able to find myself in an educator role and really felt that it was important to talk about safe drug use and I think that that truly is how we can succeed safely is to be educated and so that went over well mostly but sometimes not as well so how did you was there like a was there like a breakup with instagram or like when were you like okay i'm not doing this anymore I'm, i i want to take more charge of my content and you mm -hmm. know not be beholden to algorithms and shadow banning and all that stuff yeah well learning all of that through TikTok and instagram was a kind of a crash course and truth be told, I don't know what happened. I can speculate what happened, but my account on Instagram got shut down. Mm -hmm. I had been talking about psilocybin specifically. I was talking about microdosing and there was some private conversations through my email account. Like there were people in my email list that they knew that I had been working with MDMA and doing couples work with my husband and they were curious about it. And I was kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, like, should I talk about this? There were enough people asking that I felt like it was a worthy conversation. And so I talked about it on an IG live and, you know, I posted the, the recording and the comments blew up. I was called like an enabler. I was, you know, somebody had suggested that I was trying to be a cool mom. I was pushing drugs on kids, that I was a drug addict. Like there were many, many things that were coming in and the, the comment section had never been so hot. And so I suspected that this was not good, but I was really responding responsibly. I would, I had my own community in the comments, you know, being in support and then nothing, it just lights out. And so I'm speculating. I do have, I have a story, but you know, I don't know if it's true and Instagram never responded. So if I were to share the story, it would be giving one particular person too much credit, but some days I think it was deliberate and other days, I think it was just a complete fluke, but I don't know. So I paid somebody generously in Bitcoin to try to revive it. And, you know, that's probably a scam as well, but it was, it was completely gone. That's the story, but it was the best day of my life. Just like getting fired when I got kicked off Instagram, I couldn't have been more grateful. It was a gut punch and I thought I was going to die, but you know, I didn't know what else to do. And I just left it. I just said it. I just sat with not doing anything for quite some time. And thankfully I had grown my email list to about 16,000 and that I nurtured, I have a good system with my email. I have a very, very vigorous scrub. If people don't open six emails, they're gone. I don't care if they came and went. I want people to be highly engaged. And so I really just kept talking through email and people would show up in my inbox and they'd ask for me to you know, come back or what's happening and a lot of concern. There's a lot of rumors apparently in the metaverse about what happened. I didn't go to jail. Like it, you know, there, it was kind of a funny thing that I had this, this following and then I just aborted the whole thing. I realize now that I was being consumed in ways that I wasn't really giving consent to. I was 24 seven, I had no boundaries. People were asking me really, really intensely personal things about their life. And as much as I can give information, like talk to your doctor or find a therapist, like it's still, I'm still a person that needs to manage that information. And it was a lot. And I was completely 
physically, emotionally exhausted by the end of it. And like the, the biggest push in my online career was between January 21 and August of 21. But it built my list to the point where I could actually just keep my list, talk to the people in a really open way because I wasn't being monitored. I wasn't being trolled. And if they didn't show up, to open the emails, they were gone. So it was a nice way to manage it. And now, you know, two years later, I have a lot of conversations and those people are still engaged. I want to go back really quickly to something that you said about like, it's, I don't think it's talked about enough about like how we always say like, you know, have your boundaries, like haters on the internet are just going to say what they're going to say. And like, yeah, like all of that is super true. But like, I think it's not talked about enough how like some of that stuff really still hurts. Like it's like, you know, like, especially like in the volume that sometimes it could come at creators. Like it's like, I don't think people realize if they haven't had a video that has gone viral or like, you know, has had that level of exposure, like it can be tough sometimes. And like, you're still a human being at the end of the day. And it's like, you know, some of those messages are going to get through no matter what, like no matter how many defenses that you have up, like even if your guard is up, like you're still a human being, like it's like, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I am just a human with a certain set of skills. I don't know everything. I'm not pretending to know everything but some of the creators i don't know that much my TikTok is still live i turned off all the comments because drug plugs were showing up in my comments constantly people were getting harassed by people selling stuff online so i turned off all my comments i haven't posted in over a year on TikTok, but like other creators with big accounts were like coming in with their like minions and like this is not real this science does not add up it's like okay i read a scientific journal i didn't read the study and so the scientific journal i took as quality information is then being taken like one generation back to the actual study which wasn't intended but the interpretation of the study was actually well researched and so there's questions about like the validity of information that i'm using but like how many people actually go to the very source of the study to find out the intention of the study before actually like talking about a study through a scientific journal like this nuance of information and then all these other people that are apparently scientists know better than i do because i didn't cite this particular information that was not included in this journal. I cited the journal. So I'm not a doctor. Maybe I was in over my head, but what I was sharing, I felt was like user friendly and it was entry level. I wasn't talking to doctors. I was talking to people that had opportunities to learn and it, it was hard. It was very hard. I'm so sad. I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> So I know that you've kind of shifted things over to Substack. So can you explain mm -hmm. a little bit about like what that platform is, what you're doing differently, as well as like how the results there compare to the other platforms that you've been using? Yeah, for sure. I love that question. I was waiting. I'm just waiting. <laughs> this is an unpopular opinion. I have a static grid on my Instagram account, which I absolutely love. I put it together because I want it to come out as, you know, it's not, you know, people still look at Instagram. They're like, it's a gateway. Like you anywhere, I'm sure listeners are going to look into Instagram if they're curious about me. So I did want to have a presence there. So I did a static grid. I have information about my work and my practice, but on the interesting conversations about drugs and about drug use and about safe drug use and about my drug use and about authors who talk about drug use and systems that you know i think we need to be aware of when it comes to drug use like that all happens on substack and there is no algorithm they aren't monitoring our your content. And I can see the benefits and the, the drawbacks to that. There was a lot of people that I think were certainly harmful on social media platforms that were banned through the pandemic because of the misinformation and the, the stuff that they were spreading. They happily moved over to Substack because they don't, they're not bound by any of these rules. But the, the way I feel safe on Substack is that people have to know 
what they're looking for. There is nothing pushed. I'm not getting sent. People aren't getting sent my information. They have to actually Google it or go into the search bar and Substack to figure out who I am or what I'm talking about. I was able to migrate my entire list over. When I lost Instagram, I lost 7,000 followers. I didn't have a sing. I, I lost three years worth of content. I didn't like, I didn't back anything up. I don't know what I said back then, but people were listening. So I kind of wish I had. So if anybody is listening and your content could be flagged, do have a backup somewhere. So, and there's no charge and they do have a pretty user-friendly platform where, you know, you just plug and play. You've got a lot of different templates for bios and graphics, and they do have a sequence for a welcome sequence. They do have the options for subscribers to pay. When you do open to have subscribers, that's when you give them a cut. And if you ever leave, you leave with your list, you leave with your content. And so the difference for me is that I had my highest earning year as a coach. And as I did have two online communities, I had a breathwork community and had a microdosing community in 2021. So my highest earning revenue in 2021 was a record. And in 2022, I had no social media until August. I had Substack that I fired up in March and I had a 10% decrease in my income from 2021 to 2022. So that is, for me, I, I can see that there was a benefit and it could have been because I was running groups and not all my work now is one-on-one. -on -one. I only see clients individually and I work in one or six month packages. So I have a high retention, but like when it comes to dollars from one year to the next, I paid a ton of money for my social media to be the presence that I had. And I pay nothing for Substack. I do all my own writing. Actually, that's not true. I have a graphic designer. She's brilliant. And she does all my graphics. So I get them. Sorry, that's not fair to say I get them by the quarter. So it doesn't feel like it's a monthly expense. So I have a graphic designer and I do all my own content. And that's the expense of my Substack. I could turn on like I said earlier, I could turn on the pledges or the subscriptions and see where that goes. I like having free content and I do think that it's a privilege that I can do that, I can offer that. I'm not earning income from my writing. And I haven't at this point, I had a CTA in my probably December email. I had two openings for clients in December. And so I threw up a CTA, did some discovery calls because my coach told me to. And I think that was last, I had a, I had a CTA last February because I had an opening and then I had one in December, but I don't, I don't need to be using Substack as my source of clients. They will come to me when they're ready and they know that I'm available. If I have an opening, I'll let them know. And so I'm in a really fortunate position and I've been able to maintain a strong foundation of clients, but I also only see 10 to 12 clients at a time. So it isn't, a lot of my work is writing and content producing. I also think of myself as a writer. <laughs> I'm like coming out of my shell as a writer. So I spend a lot of time just writing as I want to say as a hobby, but it's more than a hobby. It's kind of a passion. So fortunately I have the ability to do that. I'm so glad you're sharing this with us today. This is, I work almost exclusively with coaches and course creators now. And I, my entire thing that I'm talking about day in and day out is that you don't have to fit somebody else's launch formula, or you don't have to like look at this coach and be like, well, they run Facebook ads to a sales page. And then they send this many emails. Like there's so many different ways to do it. And you have to do it in like what lights up your energy, right? Mm -hmm. I have clients that can't run Facebook ads because she's a sex therapist. I have a client who like you doesn't use social media at all because he's not comfortable there. So he's writing amazing emails and the value is in the emails. And those, those email readers are so much more engaged than anyone on social media. And that's why there's this much, this personal connection, this like value exchange that happens that then they're so much more willing to work with you to buy from you. So I just, I'm so glad you're sharing this story because you, you're my, my, here's another example of you don't have to do it the way everyone else is doing it. I love Love it so much and fuck the the whatever they are told because yeah. you know, it may work for them but it's like what I have learned myself is that we have to find our own way there's no one way it just doesn't work that way and I love my coach for pushing me the discovery calls that she made me offer like her, the, when I got kicked out <laughs> 
social media. It's the same coach, Sonia Simone. She's beautiful. She said to me, you have to be smart in public. And that is how people will trust you. And, you know, little did we know that that was going to lead to where it led to, but I had enough of a reputation with the people that I was talking to that the ones that wanted to stick around would. Now, this last piece of wisdom was you need to talk to more people. So I opened my discovery calls. I pitched podcasts. I have like I have a plan and it doesn't look like anything I could have purchased from anyone. And it doesn't look like the way she wanted it to look. It looks like the way I feel it works for me. And these conversations, if it helps your clients, if it helps you with your clients, if it helps me, like that's the richness in community and conversations and humanity. Like this, I think is more important than, you know, me harding your images on Instagram or showing up in your DM saying, Hey, I think I can, you know, help you with your IBS. Like, I don't want that. I want a conversation. Yeah. I don't know about your IBS. But. <laughs> It's a weird DM. So to somebody who maybe was looking to build the, a business outside of social media, the tip back up your stuff is a great tip. Do you have any other mm -hmm. tips you'd give to somebody who was, you know, sort of on the fence and saying this life sounds a lot better than what I'm doing right now? Yeah, I love that you mentioned earlier your seven sequence email and it seems to kind of like flow through you. I would have paid you to write my emails in the past because I didn't think I could. I think copy editors and copywriters and they have an enormous gift and that that is helpful and if somebody is DIYing please like just write and I didn't take email that seriously until I had to but thankfully I knew enough that I had enough of a like a formula to get people interested I did a lot of I guess like the, I think the thing that kind of got me in front of enough people was the open house on my breathwork class don't be afraid to give things away like we're so people are so like oh we need to charge dollars for hours or whatever like don't be a don't be a money mindset shithead like i don't think that's true if you want to give something away or if you want to have a conversation i just saw somewhere just randomly that there's this woman that every when every tuesday evening has an open call for people white people to talk about like what it's like to do anti-racism work. I didn't know that existed. And I hope that her program, I can, her, I think her name is Kimberly Dark. I don't know anything about her, but I do think that those are the places where people need the need to lean into, or if they have a service to offer, because not everybody can afford a coach. Not everybody can afford equity and inclusion programmer, but a conversation could lead to a book or to a podcast or something that helps us all. So if somebody is starting new, one, right, two, join groups or join the conversation, join places where people you trust are leaders. The other thing that I think is really important is to work with teachers or educators that aren't like you, that may argue with you or may offer you a different opinion, because I think we can get caught in a bit of an echo chamber of like, do this, do this, do this. And then we're just recycling shit that doesn't work. I love that. This is something that we ask everybody that comes on the podcast, but if you could go back in time and to when you're just starting your business, what's one piece of advice that you would tell yourself or like one like golden nugget? Yeah, I really believe that I believed in the past that spending money on high ticket programs that promised overnight success was really the way to build overnight success. I don't know, I want to say systems that just are money grabs. It would have saved me like my year of, of 2017 was $100,000. And, you know, I'm not in a position where it like destroyed me, but I could have been and I wished I'd known. I wished I'd known that I was a target for people selling hope, selling the magic pill, bullet, whatever. And if it sounds too good to be true, it is like, I wish people believe that. That's a good one. We haven't gotten anything like that yet. Okay. So what's coming up? What do you want to let our listeners know about that's coming down the pipeline for you? It's coming down. I, I love Substack. Please, if you want to just hang out, read it or not, you don't, you can read it without even subscribing. And I want to do more writing. I want to be more storytelling. You know, I think as everybody evolves, I have held back because I haven't felt like I was a good enough storyteller or a good enough writer. I'm, I'm working working on it. I'm getting better and I'm taking courses for like a local writing guilds to be a better writer. So if you like 
reading stories about people who do drugs, I got some. And where can our listeners find you online besides Substack? Anywhere, you know, email, website, any of that kind of good stuff. Yes, I have a website, coachkathleeno.com. I am on Instagram, The Real Coach O. I'm on TikTok, Coach Kathleen O. And the best place ever to find me is on Spotify because I make really great playlists. I think music and being creative have really, it's been a good marriage that way, so. Oh my God, Spotify, I'm, I'm there. No, I don't think anybody's plugged their playlists yet and I'm down for that too. I've got them, <laughs> got you. Yeah, we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes yeah. also so that everybody can check it out. Thank you so much for joining us, Kathleen. This has been such a treat. I have had a crush on you for a real long time. It's not just your hair and your beautiful eyes. It's nice to meet you, Lauren. It's been, we've been around. We just haven't actually had this opportunity. So I really am so grateful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review and be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Until next time, stay sparkly.